we can begin. Uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, morning session of the opening workshop. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Lennar Meyer from Utrecht, and uh, the title of his talk is uh, Chromatic Localizations of Algebraic Type Theory. Lennar? Yeah. I want to thank the organizers very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So um, before I start with the content, I want to say two things. First of all, so this is a joint work with Markus Land, Aki Matthew, and Georg Tamme. And actually the main result, I mean, that kind of we wrote a paper. Uh, first, it was only a paper together with uh, Markus and Georg, but then Akil joined uh, the team. And it turned out at the end that uh, this paper and another paper by Dustin Clausen, Aki Matthew, Nico Naumann, and Justin Noel are actually logically uh, interdependent. So uh, in some sense, they are kind of secretly also co-authors of this. <laughs> uh, so uh, the other thing is that, uh, so I have, I think 75 minutes, but so John von Neumann once said, uh, no lecture should be longer than a micro century. So micro century is about 52 minutes. So what I plan to do is uh, first uh, talk about yeah, I don't know, precisely say 45 minutes, then have a five minute break. And then there will be a second part of the talk. So in the first part, I will speak about the, introduce a little bit the topic, uh, give the results and some applications. And in the second part, I will say something about the proofs. So if you felt that the first part was maybe already not for you, then yeah, you can just skip the second part if you want. Okay, so uh, let me uh, say something about algebraic K theory. So in this first part, I will uh, use algebraic K theory, so to speak, as a black box. So we might start with a ring and, uh, or, uh, and then what does algebraic K theory do? It is some machinery which spits out a spectrum. So I start with some R and I will get at the end some spectrum K of R. And I want to say you can not only do this with a ring actually, you can uh, also do this with a ring spectrum. And by ring spectrum here, I will always mean what is often called an A infinity ring spectrum or also an E1 ring spectrum. So something, say, if you want to say it like this, which can be modeled by uh, uh, ring spectrum, a symmetric spectrum or something like this. Not only homotopy associative, but kind of something better. Okay. So, and we call uh, Ki of R being the i homotopy group of K of R, uh, the higher, Algebraic K groups of R. And these have been introduced by Quill. Uh, well, I guess uh, there's some history in this. Uh, so one has, I guess, would have to uh, name some other names like Swan, for example. But yeah. So, uh, but the lower algebraic K theory starting with K0 were already known before, and K0 was introduced by Grotendieck. So if R is a ring, then K0 of R has a very classical interpretation. So it's a group completion. Of the monoid of isomorphism classes. Of finitely generated projective modules. So this is of course a thing uh, of a lot of classical interest. Uh, and then you might ask, uh, why do we want to introduce? So you can ask two things. So why do we want to introduce um, the higher algebraic K groups? Why is it a good thing? Uh, if we maybe are mainly, some people might be mainly interested in K0, you might ask, why do we want to generalize to arbitrary R? 
So uh, there are several reasons, so different motivations. So it turns out that these higher uh, K groups uh, encode arithmetic of R. So for example, if uh, R are the integers, then you can read off something about the values of the Dedekind zeta function from this. And uh, so the higher K groups come up in exact sequences and spectral sequences. Computing uh, K zero. So, so as like in uh, ordinary homology, even if you are only interested in H zero, like something is connected or not, in some arguments, you always will use higher homology stuff. And uh, then the last thing, kind of k theory ring spectra. It's important. In high dimensional uh, geometric topology. So actually, so say you have a manifold M, uh, take a loop space and take the suspension spectrum. Because the loop space has a multiplication, this inherits the structure of a ring spectrum. And then we can take the K theory. And this is related to uh, the different morphism groups uh, of M. So by some theorems, uh, Essentially, the parameter, uh, it's about the parameterized h cobordism theorem, uh, which due to Waldhausen, and there's a book by uh, Jahren, Rockness, and Waldhausen about this. And in particular, uh, we might take so uh, if M is a point, okay, the different morphism groups of a point are not very interesting, but uh, you also get it, uh, you get other information also around this, out of this. Uh, this would give that we are interested in the K-theory of the sphere spectrum. So these are some uh, reasons why we might also be interested in the higher algebraic K-theory groups and also in the K-theory spectrum of ring spectra. So there are basically two approaches to study spectrum. Uh, like K of R, but this applies to essentially to any spectrum. So the first one would be calculate the homotopy groups. The second thing is to apply localization functors. So to use a crude analogy, so say you want to have a whole group of people, a big group of people, uh, you want to learn something about their behavior. So the first approach would be like, uh, you kind of put them all in a kind of line and you start asking the first person about what his name, what does he work at, uh, where does he work at, and uh, what does he do with his time. And you learn a lot about each single person, but it takes a lot of time. So after spending, uh, a week, you might have kind of learned something about the first 20 people. Uh, and uh, these you know very well, but you don't know very much about what they do at, as a whole, the whole group. So applying localization functors more like you put this uh, people all in a big space and then you shout fire and see what the whole group does. And then you watch it. And this would be more like you apply a localization functor to this and see what happens. And uh, this doesn't, at the end, you might not even know the name of the first guy, but you have some idea what the group as a whole does. So, okay, back uh, to math, uh, I would say, okay, so this, this approach, of course, is very valuable because we're interested in these groups, but uh, uh, for very few 
uh, we know all the groups. And um, we do it for, say, finite fields. This was done by Quill, algebraically closed fields. Uh, it's also nice, uh, but uh, say even for the integers, uh, the, the 12 homotopy groups, I think, is still no, not known yet. And we know a lot about the K3 groups of the integers, but we don't know all of them. So let me talk about localization functors. So um, the easiest example, so this will be the approach that I uh, will talk about. So the easiest example of such a localization functor is just rationalization. So it's called LQ. So we send a spectrum X to its rationalization. And for spectra, this works extremely nicely. We just tensor the homotopy groups with the rational numbers. So this is the outcome. So for example, we obtain that if we rationalize the sphere spectrum, we obtain the einberg lane spectrum of the rational numbers because all the higher homotopy groups are torsion. And actually put this H in brackets because I will have the habit of often leaving out the H just viewing a abelian group also as a spectrum by the einberg lane construction. And then it's an extremely nice result by Waldhausen. which is key to understand something about the rational algebraic K-theory. So let R to S be a morphism of connective ring spectra. So connective means uh, pi star is zero for star is smaller than zero. It should be an isomorphism on pi zero and should be in rational equivalence. Then uh, the map between rationalization of the K theory spectra is also an equivalence. Okay. So in general, uh, there's no reason to expect from the definitions of algebraic K theory that uh, if you have something which is rational equivalence and uses rational equivalence, but Waldhausen says, okay, we have to ask for connective isomorphism on pi zero, but then we get what we want, that K theory preserves rational equivalences. And one of the crucial examples is here. So say we take the K theory of the sphere spectrum, which uh, promises to be extremely complicated. Well, but if we rationalize it, then it will be equivalent to uh, the K theory of the integers. So why is this? Because uh, we have a morphism from the sphere spectrum to the integers. It's an isomorphism on pi zero, both are connective. And I've just discussed that rationally, the sphere spectrum is just Q. And of course, the integers are rationally also Q. And this has been calculated by Borel. And likewise, you can imagine, let me scroll up a moment, that say we have a a spectrum like this, extremely hard to understand, even like this spectrum itself, but rationally, it might simplify it drastically. And this allows us to uh, say something about the rational K theory of these guys. And thus also at the end, maybe after some kind of, uh, kind of calculations about the rational homotopy groups of the diffeomorphism space. And uh, I should also remark uh, this remark so Waldhausen's result also works for uh, uh, functor x goes to to this. So this kind of localization, uh, or maybe maybe that's just denoted a little bit shorter like this. We can just invert one prime p 
so this is the same effect on homotopy groups inverting just one prime p. Okay. But it turns out, so from the viewpoint of chromatic homotopy theory, X going to uh, inverting P or rationalizing is just the zeroth in a whole tower of localization functors. So uh, Uh, so these are, let me move it down just a little bit. Uh, I want to call them, a, so this name is kind of complicated, but uh, if you want, you can ignore the name a bit. Uh, these are localization functors, so-called L and PF. So these are functors from spectra to spectra. And in the easiest case, they send just a, spectrum to something where we invert P. Okay. And I should say P will be fixed throughout the talk. So, so I don't have to kind of, uh, kind of take it in uh, uh, notation everywhere. Okay. So there's this kind of tower of localization functors. And actually it turns out they are extremely canonical. So, um, so there's, I mean, we don't know all localization functors on spectra, but if we demand certain things, then actually we can classify them. And it turns out if we demand that, um, so every localization functor has a category of acyclics, meaning the things which go to zero after applying this localization functor. Like here, if something is p-torsion. And uh, if we demand that uh, the acyclics are generated by finite spectra, then one can classify localization functors. And then one essentially just gets uh, these kind of towers uh, I've just discussed, I discuss here. But I won't give a definition, but I just say these are kind of very canonical things to consider. Um, yeah. So uh, Bastian uh, asked, uh, how do we define localization functors? Well, uh, localization functor, uh, one way to think about this is, so, we have some kind of, uh, some subcategory C, and so it factors. Um, so this is a left adjoint going from spectra to C, and uh, the right adjoint of this left adjoint is fully faithful. And the composition functor is a localization functor. So here, um, and the, so the image, so this C will be just the image of the localization functor. So in this case here, it would be everything where P is invertible, for example, would be the C. Okay. So, and if you have a tower, the natural uh, thing to do is always also to consider the fibers. So the fiber here is uh, denoted by LTN. So it's a so-called telescopic localization. Okay. So this was a lot of notation. So, uh, let me make a few remarks about this. So the first one is, this localization is closely related to uh, localization at the nth more of a K theory, which is probably a little bit better known. And so the telescope conjecture says uh, they are actually equal. But uh, as the name conjecture says, it's not known and it's extremely wide open in general. So I think nobody knows even whether they should be true or false. Although uh, if you ask different people, you get different opinions here. Uh, but it's known 
for n equals one. This is a work by Mahovod and Miller and known for modules over, uh, over complex bordism spectrum. And a lot of, and from this you can also deduce it for a lot of other spectra we like. So in practice, often one can actually replace one by the other, but uh, not always. But it turns out that uh, we can only prove certain of our theorems if we work with this functor. And uh, if we could prove the telescope conjecture, of course, we could only do it also do it for this one. But this might be for another talk. Uh, and uh, to kind of avoid uh, this heavy notation, I was also want to introduce some kind of lighter terminology. So we say x to y is an equivalence in height n. If it becomes equivalence after applying LTN. So height is kind of something one often, the notion one often uses to, if one thinks about these things, that this isolates the information in height N, whatever this precisely means, but now we just take it as a definition. And then LNPF sees the heights zero up to n, because we have all the tn's from t0 to tn kind of uh, building up these LNPFs. So this is the way you should think about this. And um, some examples. So z, we call my uh, my uh, convention is the same as HC, is concentrated in height height zero, meaning that if we apply LTN to it for n bigger or equal to one, then it just becomes zero. So if we look at complex K theory, this is concentrated in heights uh, zero and one. And then uh, there are more examples. For example, some people are, like me like topological model of forms. So if you don't know what this is, don't worry, but this would be concentrated in heights zero, one, and two. And the sphere spectrum is concentrated in all heights. Okay. Uh, and uh, some remark here, uh, result of Hahn, implies that if uh, R is an E infinity ring spectrum, so something like commutative, if the uh, nth uh, TN localization vanishes, then uh, the TN plus first localization also vanishes. So this is a very remarkable theorem. So this implies, so thus, uh, such an R, thus the heights of R concentrated in consecutives, consecutive degrees. So it cannot happen that we have heights one, two, and five, but uh, the, the third and the fourth uh, TN localizations are zero. This cannot happen. So this explains a little bit why we have this. So here only in height zero, here in zero and one, here in zero, one, and two. And uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this explains a lot of stuff and we actually, this will be also crucial to some later applications. So, so far, any questions about my uh, very short introduction to algebraic K theory and chromatic homotopy theory?
Okay, then I will go on with the main theorem. And I think I should also uh, include here Klaus and Matthew, uh, Naumann and Noel. Although it's not stated in their paper, uh, we really heavily use the results. So let n be equal to 1 and let n r to s. be a uh, morphism of wing spectra which an equivalence in heights n minus 1 and n And this thing is an equivalence in height n. So we need kind of two consecutive degrees here, two consecutive heights to get, uh, so it's not quite true. And we actually see that's actually not true that if this is an equivalence in height n, then this will also be an equivalence in height n. So this is not true, but we just need two degrees and then we get it. So, um, so for n equals zero, this would be essentially a Waldhausen's result. But note that Waldhausen needed uh, this connectivity assumption. His ring spectra need to be connective and an isomorphism on pi zero or something, some related condition, while it turns out that higher heights, uh, we can get rid of connectivity. Okay. So um, I plan to give uh, three examples, or I guess three applications of this, and uh, then uh, we'll stop the first part of my talk. So the first thing will be about the redshift conjecture. So um, this is uh, has been pioneered by Rockness and uh, also Neil Rockness. Um, so the precise formulation I will give, I'm not sure they would kind of agree with this, but yeah, let me just give a formulation. So let R be an infinity ring spectrum. So then the Tn minus one localization of R is zero if and only if the Tn localization of K of R is zero. So the slogan is K-theory shifts height by one. Okay. And so why is it called redshift? So redshift is always if you uh, increase uh, the height of something, then it's called a redshift. I mean, the reason kind of goes similar back. So this whole area is called chromatic homotopy theory and um, so the historic reasons are that this area arose from studying of periodic families of uh, elements and stable homotopy groups of spheres. And if something is periodic, I mean, it looks a little bit like a wave. Uh, so some light wave. And uh, if the period is very uh, gets higher, then the light shifts to red. And uh, in this uh, and 
in the story, kind of the periods are higher if the height increases. So if the height increases, it's a red shift and the height decreases would be a blue shift. So, uh, so back from physics to, uh, to topology. So actually one of these directions is now a theorem. So namely this direction follows from our main theorem. Uh, so why is this? So by the result of Hahn I mentioned, we get this implication. So R to zero is equivalence in heights n minus one and n. So K of R to K of zero, which is certainly zero, is equivalence in height n. So uh, I should say special cases have been known before. Uh, an incomplete list is the following. So case the K theory of the integers. Uh, so Mitchell showed, oh, let's see. So this is concentrated. And height zero and one. So this was the result by Mitchell. So, uh, and you kind of uh, translate the terminology. So, so Z is concentrated in height zero and that this is concentrated in height zero and one it's preci uh, precisely kind of con uh, would be a consequence of this thing here and not in higher heights. Okay. So, and uh, K theory of KU was a much studied example, concentrated in heights zero, one, and two. So this was proven by also Neil and Rockness for primes bigger or equal to five and I think uh, Angelini Null and Endo Salk uh, were the first ones who extend this. I mean, they extend this to prime two and three. I think they were the, at least the first ones who published, uh, kind of put this on the archive, prime two and three. Although uh, Dustin Klaus, Nakim Matthew, Norman Noel have also, I think, an equivalent result, which remained unpublished at that time. And uh, yeah. And then one can also go to higher heights where there also have been some previous results, but very limited say for K theory of something like, yeah, maybe uh, of TMF, there was something known, yes. Okay. So, and I just want to shortly mention, uh, talk about the converse. So uh, let me scroll up for a moment. So that this vanishing implies this vanishing. Actually, one usually thinks about this in the kind of uh, uh, what's called the, the contrapositive way. So this does not vanish implies that this does not vanish. And this has also been known in a number of cases. So, so uh, this is certainly non-zero. So uh, the easiest way to show this would be compared to K theory of Z uh, has a uh, map to complex K theory. And there we know that the localization does not vanish. But actually it turns out there's a much deeper fact that, okay, we maybe don't take the K theory of Z itself, but uh, Z or one over P, then one knows essentially what how this relates to the K theory of Z one over P. I will say a word about this in a moment. And uh, likewise, uh, this is known. So it also shifts height by one. 
So this is uh, again also near rockness in uh, difficult computation at points bigger equal to five, and uh, uh, this also for uh, for primes two and three, or actually, yeah, say for primes two and three, uh, this is a special case of a recent result of Hahn and Wilson. And Hahn and Wilson, uh, so this, I just write it down. And uh, so if you don't know what BPN is, uh, uh, don't worry. So this is some spectrum of height n they show that the TN plus one localization of this does not vanish. Uh, and precisely this is one specific form of BPN they construct. So this is the first example of known example of this height shifting uh, of this converse uh, where the height is bigger than uh, two. So it's a very, very pretty result they prove. Okay. Any questions about this in the moment? Okay, so second class of examples are what we might call purity uh, results. Although, I mean, sometimes we have the feeling everything and nothing is called purity in math. So uh, yeah, but let's just call it this way. So, so one consequence is of our Mendes result that if R is a ring, that uh, if we look at the K theory of R going to a K theory of R one over P, this is our equivalence in height one. So it's an equivalence after T one localization. So indeed, So we have to check this equivalence in height zero and height one. Well, in height one, it turns out both things are zero because it's true for Z and then just for all rings that they vanish in height one. So we just have to see it in height zero. And the height zero localization was just inverting P. So it's clear that this induces an isomorphism after inverting P. So, uh, and let me just say something about what I said earlier. So, um, for R nice, so this remark, uh, and one over P is in R, then Then turns out that uh, this is an ISO, uh, except in low degrees. So it turns out that this localization actually captures a lot about the KT of the wing, namely the P completion, if uh, one over P is an R. And the niceness uh, assumption is actually very mild, so I don't want to go into this. So example for the integers, I think it would be beginning with pi one. This would be an isomorphism. And in some sense, the, the result uh, I just said, and I should say this was originally due with a very different proof, uh, but, uh, but Clausen and Matthew. This result in some way explains why one has to invert P here. Because uh, K-theory itself is certainly uh, sensitive to inverting p, but we show that if we t1 localize it becomes insensitive. And you can deduce all kinds of nice uh, formal properties of this functor from just knowing that this is an equivalence uh, in t1 localization, like homotopy invariance and some descent results and stuff like this, excision. But actually, so, uh, so this was kind of a classical algebra but we can go further. So another example would be, uh, so if R is a KU algebra, so then, 
yeah, just uh, let, let me just st state one uh, one case. So say I want to understand the k-theory of R. So this might be easier if I invert P. So a uh, map like this. So it might be also easier if I invert the bot element. So uh, beta and pi two of KU is the bot element. Then I can do both. Ah, so this uh, becomes Cartesian. So a pullback square after applying T1 localization. Or well, actually also Tn localization for every bigger n. Okay. So this maybe can explain why I want to call these things the purity result. So uh, so slogan would be uh, so k in this case T1 localization of K theory only uh, does not depend, so it does not change if we take out sorry my pen has some problems come uh, vanishing locus of P and beta so this might only make sense if you have some algebraic geometry picture in mind. Uh, so, so if you take the pullback of these three things, you get morally speaking the um, the evaluating. So you imagine you have uh, something like spec R and take the uh, structure sheaf of wing spectra on this, and taking the pullback of this kind of thing would result in. I take out the common vanishing locus of P and beta and then evaluate on this open set. And so this thing, the common vanishing locus has co-dimension two and that taking out things of co-dimension two does not change the result is often algebraic geometry uh, called a purity theorem, like for Brouwer groups or Picard groups. So I'm not sure this was understandable, but uh, if not, then... Uh, yeah, then not. Uh, and I also want to say we can, this was just one example. For example, another example would be we can replace KU by MU uh, T1 by TN and P and beta by VN minus one and VN. So for people uh, to whom this, uh, like VNs mean something. Other questions about this? Okay. Then I want to quickly mention the third application, namely to connective covers. So, uh, result is that. If you take the connective cover of a wing, actually it has the same K theory, not, not uh, stating in, in general, this would be just wrong, uh, would be it's an equivalence. equivalence. In heights, uh, bigger or equal to two. Since one can show that, and this is like a classical result, this an equivalence in heights bigger equal to one. And actually, okay, this has nothing to do uh, with our work. So, so maybe this is a corollary. Uh, another corollary of this, uh, and uh, further thing is that actually, uh, for people who know trace methods. This is also an equivalence in heights. Big way to two. 
And because the proof is uh, not very hard, let me just sketch it or actually give it. This has nothing to do with our work, but uh, maybe it's good to highlight this. So there's the Dundas Goodwill McCarthy theorem. Which gives us, say, up to uh, after p completion, a Cartesian square like this. And well, this thing vanishes in heights big or equal to two. So this follows, for example, from this Mitchell theorem I mentioned earlier, but it would also follow from our results, but this would be an overkill because this is concentrated in height zero. So this can only be uh, in height zero and one. And the same thing follows then for TC, since uh, uh, this thing is a ring map. This map is a ring map. So if the uh, source is zero, then also target will be also be zero. And then this part will be an equivalence then in heights bigger equal to two. So this was everything I want to say in the first part of my talk. Are there questions about this? Okay. So then maybe it's a good moment for a five minute break. And uh, so let's continue at I think 22 past. 10 in my time zone, which might be different in some other time zones. Okay, so at least on my clock it's 22, but maybe wait for another minute because my experience is that people are always uh, one minute late from a break. Um, well, Leonard, I, I maybe have one quick question. Mm -hmm. Um, can you, I mean, at the beginning you said R, R is A infinity, but at some point everything was E infinity. Can you say again where this was? Right. So, uh, I mean, in some cases it's more convenient. So, um, so here at the redshift conjecture, I said E infinity. Obviously, when you use Jeremy stuff, yes. Yes. I mean, if we use A infinity, we would get that if it vanishes in Tn minus 1 and Tn, then the K theory vanishes Tn locally. Oh, that's still the conjecture? No, I mean, this is, I mean, it's known that if R is A infinity or E1 and uh, it vanishes in Tn minus one and Tn, then our result implies that it vanishes in Tn, uh, K theory vanishes in Tn. But uh, kind of we use E infinity to get this kind of one X, kind of get one of, rid of this assumption. But do you really want to conjecture the converse for A infinity? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the converse is the much trickier part anyhow. <laughs> so uh, so I'm not sure in which general, if this is even, I, I have no idea whether this is true in general for E infinity. But no. E infinity doesn't seem to be the correct thing to do because I mentioned that uh, Jeremy and Dylan proved this thing for BPN. And we know BPN for N large is never E infinity. And they, what they need crucially is an E3 structure, which they construct. And, uh, but I mean, it also would sound weird if I conjectured for E3 ring spectra here. Oh, so, really weird A, A infinity rings. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm not sure in which generality one should conjecture it. But uh, so this is why I said E infinity to be, I'm not sure it's on the safe side, but on the safer side. Uh, okay, right. And before I go on, I also want to mention that, uh, I mean, there's, I said this list I gave you is incomplete. For example, there's also nice work by Angelini Noll and uh, JD Quigley. And uh, yeah, there, one should list some other people as well. And I'm sorry if I forgot anyone. Okay, so let's come to the second part where I want to explain something uh, of the proof of the main theorem. And maybe let's uh, copy this. But uh, before I say something on proof, I want to make a brief review of different models of K-theory because this will play a role 
in a moment. I assume that most of people have heard about these different models. And it's just a reminder, this is why I've pre-written this. And if it's if you haven't heard about this and it's too quick, then uh, yeah, you can either ask or read it in one of the sources for K-theory. So say we have a ring spectrum R and want to define K-theory. So there are different ways to do this. And the first two I want to briefly talk about only work for connective ring spectra. And the third one works for all ring spectra. So the first one is in some sense the most classical one. We look at projective R modules, finally generated projective R modules. And, and you can actually define also for ring spectrum by just saying we take a retract of the free guys. Just the same definition as in usual algebra, take the full subcategory or sub-infinity category of modules. Okay, then uh, we restrict to the uh, equivalences here. Uh, or isomorphisms in the classical case of rings. And we have an infinity groupoid uh, then, which has a symmetric monoidal structure. Okay. And by sometimes called the homotopy hypothesis, uh, symmet uh, kind of symmetric model infinity category, which is at the same time infinity groupoid, the same as what some people call an E infinity space. Okay. So E infinity spaces are in general not infinite loop spaces. We need one more condition, namely that they're group-like, that pi zero of it is a group. But luckily there's a construction called group completion and we can make this E infinity space into a group, a group-like infinity space. And this would be exactly uh, then the infinite loop space of the K-theory spectrum, which I call additive K-theory spectrum here. So there's, a, I think maybe the nicest treatment in the literature I know is by, in a paper by uh, uh, Gebner, Groth, and Nikolaus. But of course, this is, has classical roots which go much farther back, say, to Siegel. Uh, and it turns out that um, in, for connective ring spectra, this K-theory spectrum I get is actually the correct one. For non-connective ones, well, it turns out that this additive K-theory is insensitive of taking connective covers, which uh, depends on what you like might be good or bad, bad news but it doesn't really give the correct K-theory spectrum for an arbitrary ring spectrum. And there's also another one uh, which only works for connective ring spectrum in a sense, the Quillen plus construction. So uh, you might be aware that, or even I mean, you might be aware of the Quillen plus construction, but even if not, you might remember the K1 of a ring was uh, of, uh, the abelianization of GL infinity of the ring. And the plus construction really mimicked from there. So we have a way to construct a GL infinity R even for ring spectrum, first by finding some N by N matrices and maybe the details are not so important and take the classifying space. Okay. But again, there's no chance that this might be an infinite loop space because pi one, so namely GL infinity R or pi zero of this is uh, not a billion, but Quillen has this very nice construction, a plus construction, which in this case forces pi one to be billion by taking a quotient, but at the same time leaves the homology intact. So this is an isomorphism in any homology theory. And then we again became that if R is connective, we can write the if it loops with this plus construction, another useful thing. And then there's a third construction, uh, which yeah, if you want to say, say it's more abstract, it's essentially due to Waldhausen. So if we have a, a, a ring or ring spectrum R, we can take its infinity category of perfect modules. So if there's a ring spectrum, we can say it's a dualizable object in R modules. And then there's a simplicial object that called S dot construction, uh, which is usually by uh, built by so-called Waldhausen shapes. Okay. So it turns out that it's equivalent to this, but this doesn't display the simplicial structure. So it's just a side remark. And then we can obtain this thing as a certain geometric realization up to one loop. So this was just a brief co collection. And uh, if I go back, then I will recall this again. Okay. okay. So, so this is the theorem uh, we want to prove. And actually it follows from two sub theorems. So the first one is the theorem proven by uh, 
Klaus Matthew now Manuel. Uh, I would just state the special case we need. So if R is concentrated, not only concentrated in heights zero to n minus two, but actually local for this localization functor. So this is a slightly stronger statement. Then uh, the K theory vanishes in high to n. So this is a slightly weaker uh, version of this redshift thing, namely uh, with this stronger condition than being constant. So this essentially says concentrate in height zero to n minus two, but it's slightly stronger. And then we say then it has to vanish in height n. And I don't want to say anything substantial about the proof, but I just want to highlight one nice feature. So, uh, so they use that. So there's a so-called Tate construction here with the trivial action. And this construction does not redshift, but it blue shifts. So it decreases height by one. So they, I mean, this was known in some way before, but they proved a, a more precise result uh, along this line for E infinity ring spectra. And they can use this uh, plus induction uh, to get their result. So this is of course an extremely brief proof sketch of uh, some clever ideas they have uh, using also results of uh, Hesselot, Nicolaus and some, uh, yeah, they're using a lot of things uh, along the way, but I find very remarkable that they use kind of this blue shift result to apply a red shift result at the end. But this really uh, kind of allows them to use induction because they can work one high, one height lower. And then there's the result, uh, which is uh, proven in our paper. So if R to S, an L and PF equivalence. So it's an equivalence in heights zero up to N. Uh, so is uh, uh, let's say let's phrase it this way to not say something wrong. So then K of R to K of S is an equivalent in height n. So before we only needed, uh, uh, in our main theorem, we only needed equivalents in heights um, uh, n minus one and n. And here we need heights zero up to n. Or actually we can weaken this also to one up to n, but yeah. Okay, so we need a bigger, a better input. So how do these two uh, theorems imply the main result? So it turns out that one can construct a Cartesian square So people might have seen a chromatic uh, fracture square. And yeah, this is like slightly unusual variant of the chromatic fracture square, plus uh, some results that uh, K-theory uh, preserves certain Cartesian squares. So maybe the details are not so important, but, but we have this Cartesian square. And now, um, if we, sorry, this is not readable at the end here. Okay. Let's look at the, uh, the lower row here. Well, uh, the theorem by Klaus and Matthew Norman Noel tells us that if something is ln minus two local, then this Tn local K theories vanish. So 
this vanish. Theon locally by Theon 1. Okay. So this means that this is a Tn equivalence. So an equivalence in height one, uh, sorry, in height n. So, but, uh, sorry, I will kind of uh, have to move this a little bit around. So, but we can also look at the morphism from here to here. So this is also a Tn equivalence by theorem one, because uh, if so, uh, certainly the map from R into its localization is an Ln equivalence here. So this implies that the whole map here is a Tn equivalence, which precisely says that uh, the K-theory of R depends only on the Tn minus one and the Tn localization. And this implies that if it's an equivalence in heights Tn minus one and N minus one and N, then it also implies a uh, an equivalence on Tn local K theory. So this is the argument. So questions about this? Okay. So, so how to prove theorem two? So step one is, uh, suppose R and S are connective, and R to S highly connected. So meaning that uh, it's an isomorphism in the lower homotopy groups for quite a range. Actually, in the lowest n homotopy groups would be enough. Okay. So then we want to, uh, then we want to prove uh, that, uh, uh, okay, then we also assume it's an ln pf equivalence. Need to show equivalence in Tn local k theory. Okay. So, and the idea is the following. So, uh, we just assume that this is an LMPF equivalence. Now comes the first crucial part, namely that this is then also an LNPF equivalence. So we use the, so more precisely, uh, I could also say uh, after applying sigma infinity. So one has to be a little careful because for spaces, there are two different versions. And I mean, I apply a certain homology, it's kind of this is detected by a certain homology theory, and I want to also do this here. The equivalent to saying that this it's on suspension spectra, it's also an LMPF equivalence. So this is a non-trivial step uh, using some results by Bausfield. And um, this also uses this high connectivity, else this would not be true. And then uh One does the same thing for this BGL infinity R and BGL infinity S. So this is not so hard to kind of deduce then. Uh, but the point is, I can also add the plus here because I said it's uh, detected by homology theory. And uh, the value of this on any homology theory does not change if I add the plus here. So, but this is the same as omega infinity K of R and this is omega infinity K of S. And then there's a third step, which uses the Pauls Kuhn functor, which implies that then this thing is a Tn equivalence. So, right, essentially because uh, the Pauls Kuhn functor allows us to uh, to uh, recover the Tn localization from of this from its omega infinity, just as a space. Uh, regardless of any uh, uh, regardless of any group structure on this. Okay. So this is a very brief sketch about this. 
Okay, and then, um, so formal arguments. So more or less formal arguments show two things. First of all, so main theorem follows from the case where s is actually zero. So let me scroll up for a moment. So I guess uh, I guess theorem one, I should uh, theorem two, I should say. Um, so this was this theorem here. So if s is zero, this just means that if r is zero in height zero to n, we want that the k theory also vanishes in height n. Okay, this follows from the case uh, s is zero. And second of all, um, so this is true for all connective r. So here uh, we needed the additional assumption that this map here is highly connected, so R would have to vanish in a lot of degrees, but one can make some formal arguments with uh, theorem of London Tamer and stuff like this to show then for all connective R. But then crucial st uh, step is to go to non-connective R as well, because actually it turns out this reduction step only works if we allow a non-connective R as well. So we would not get anything uh, in some sense without allowing non-connective R. Well, so now comes the following idea. So to reduce to the connective case. So, so I said earlier that uh, we have the Waldhausen S dot construction says, you can recover the infinite loop space for K theory of R by taking uh, the S dot construction, okay, then we have to take equivalence here to actually get a space, taking the geometrialization of the simplicial object, okay, then one loop. Okay. So, but then we can group complete both sides. So, group complete. So, this stays the same. So group complete is, uh, um, is a left adjoint, so I can pull it into the geometricalization. So here, mm. so the group completion, so there's something I didn't say before, I can also apply this, uh, yeah, so I'm not sure it's the, so I can also apply this additive K theory thing, not only to a ring spectrum, but also to an arbitrary, for example, additive infinity category. Like for example, this uh, S dot R are additive infinity categories. So this would be omega infinity K add would be just essentially a different name for taking this equivalence thing and group completing. So, but uh, now we can use so, that uh, k add of r is the same thing as k add of the connective cover of r. And it turns out then that because here uh, we have already dealt with, with the case of connective wing spectra, uh, here, then we can also get something for these. Okay, these are not quite the ring spectrum itself, but there's certain additive categories. And if you go back one step, I've said that they're extremely closely related to uh, perf R. Namely, it's just functors from this category to perf R. And from this, you can get kind of an uh, analogous vanishing result for the T and local K theory also uh, for these things. And then you can get it for this thing. So this is very briefly summarized the strategy we take. So uh, allowing 
to reduce to connective case. Okay. So okay, this is a, okay. Very brief sketch. It's not really the complete argument, but I see that my time is up. So um, I think this is a good moment to stop. Okay, so thank you very much, Renard, for your nice talk. So are there any questions or comments? Uh, I see that there is uh, one question in the in the chat. So maybe can you read it? Yeah. So the question is how to compute the homotopy groups of K of R for wing spectrum R, especially for BP module spectra. So I think uh, I think one can just say briefly, this is extremely difficult in general. So I said, even the K-theory groups of Z are not completely known. So it's even harder, of course, to do it, say for BP or something like this. I mean, in general, for if you have a connective link spectrum, I think m most of the time it's very good idea to use trace methods. So this, this thing called TC, and it turns out TC is a very good approximation to K-theory and uh, one can try to compute this, although this is also extremely complicated. And then uh, many cases, one can get a lot of information about the KTU groups from that. But uh, yeah, so I don't think there's an easy recipe. Okay, so any more questions? Um, Leonard, you had this um, pullback square for in the example of KU where you could first ignore a prime P and then the bot element. So, but in KU, this is a regular sequence. So do you get anything for non-regular sequences of elements or is this special to that property? Okay, so right in KU it's a regular sequence, but of course in general in the KU algebra, it would be not. So in this sense mm -hmm. it's already. Um, so, I mean, the crucial thing we use here is uh, less that's the regular sequence, but uh, the crucial thing uh, we need to use here is that if we take KU modulo P and beta, this is uh, T1, so it's T0 and T1 are cyclic. Where T0 uh, in our convention was slightly unusual, maybe it's just inverting P. So this is in some sense, uh, the crucial thing we have to use. Um, I don't think we really use that it's a regular sequence. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, basically the idea is that I um, could, okay, now uh, put here the pullback square. We, can, we cannot tell what you are writing. Ah, so maybe oh, I can sorry, find... I can now. Okay, I, okay. It was just a bit too small for me. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so we can compare it with the KT of the pullback square. And in some sense, there are two arguments. The first one is one has to say that um, this thing is a T1 local equivalence. And the other thing is to see that uh, K theory preserved this pullback square. Mm. Uh, and um, so to see that R to this thing is a T1 log, uh, T1 log equivalence in K theory, we just have to see that R to this thing is equivalence in T0 and T1 by our main theorem. And this is uh, followed essentially from this thing. So it's not directly, I think, not really directly related to being a regular sequence. Okay. Thanks. Well, we are at this page, Leonard. Uh, you said here that uh, we can replace uh, KU by a mu, but in the case of a mu, we can't just take any end that we like, right? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the last few words. So after mu, you said what? Uh, but in the case of a mu, we can take any end that we like. Yes, we can do with higher n, yes. Yes, so then is there not a convenient way of packing all the ends for me? Yes, so in some sense, it's uh, also uh, a generalization of this result here because it turns yeah. out MU is a algebra over, so KU is an algebra over MU. So yeah. this would be like inversion, which works for any N, yes. 
Okay, any more questions? So I have one more question, which is a bit more, more general. So uh, I was wondering if uh, in the proofs of, uh, of your main results, do you strongly use the machinery of infinity categories or can you just use uh, classical tools from, uh, from stable homotopy theory? Um, so I would say yes and no. So, um, so I don't think one has to use infinity categories. So one thing we used also perspective, which I didn't say that um, one can use, uh, view K-theory as an invariant of small stable infinity categories, um, so-called localizing invariant on this. One can replace this, I think, by uh, not looking at small stable infinity categories, but uh, in kind of some small categories enriched in uh, spectra. I think in principle, this would be possible. And I mean, the Waldhausen construction, I mean, this is also possible to do there, but I guess some things would be technically maybe a little bit more inconvenient. Uh, for example, this step passing to group completion, commuting with simplicializations. Yeah, one would have to kind of check some things which are a little bit nicer, I think, in the formulas of infinity categories, but I'm pretty sure one could translate everything in more classical language. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, then we will continue uh, at 11 with, uh, with a talk by Thomas Nicolaus. Yeah, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. It was a great talk, Leonard.